Good morning. This is Jason Dean at Film Fanatic. Hope everyone's doing good. Uh, happy Monday. It's about uh, 8.48. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, beginning of uh, Thanksgiving week. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, the holidays are pretty cool. I always get into the holidays for the most part. You know, Halloween being my favorite. I always do a little bit of an extra thing for for Film Fanatic around around uh, Halloween. This year I did all of the films that were part of the uh, Halloween franchise and I closed things off with Halloween Ends. Uh, I saw that. It was cool. I saw each movie starting with John Carpenter's original one from 1978. Uh, you know, the classic that that, that is. Um, I start off with that one and I watched each one in succession. And I did I did a show on almost every movie, but it was a funny thing because I I found myself not being drawn to the entire franchise like I thought. It was great watching them again, but I realized there were certain films in the franchise that I I, I just wasn't you know, so excited about, per se. So, what I tend to do when I do uh, these reviews, I try to, you know, I don't I don't usually spend time doing reviews of, of random movies that have just come out, or, um, and I don't usually do negative reviews of, of films. I don't, I don't usually focus on that kind of thing. I usually just, try to turn the show into a thing of where I just do shows on, you know, movies that are inspiring, that I love. Most of the movies that I cover are movies that I have in my collection. And I try to, you know, I try to, uh, you know, focus on those kinds of things. The one franchise that I, that I did, the first franchise that I did for this channel was the uh, Friday the 13th franchise. And I have a pretty deep love for... Uh, as a whole, the whole franchise for the most part. So I covered each movie, and that was really great. With with Halloween, it was a little bit of a slightly mixed bag for me. Certain films in that franchise, I I just thoroughly love, and so so that was really cool. I wasn't a huge fan of the last three films that came out, and then there were. A few other movies that were, I felt were good, and it was cool watching them again. Some of them I I had only seen a couple times, and obviously watching them in succession, it helps a lot of the times for franchise. Uh, you know, for, if you're covering a franchise or watching a franchise, it helps a lot with like kind of the cohesiveness of the story sometimes, and and where you know the arc of the characters or certain kinds of developments that happen along the way. And what have you. And so I was surprised by certain films that I did really enjoy. And then certain films I was like, ah, it, it's good, but I'm not. I just didn't feel inclined or super fired up to watch them all. So I didn't cover them all. I did conclude the series with Halloween Ends, which came out uh, fairly recently. It came out like two weeks, two or three weeks before Halloween and I was really surprised by that film. I was uh, taken aback. David Allen Green, who I said to, he I'm not a huge fan of his work, but I think there's some things about his ability as a director that are really great. Um, I think he's a good, a good director. I think he's skilled in many ways. The thing that I had problems with, and again, it's just my opinion. I didn't do a review. He he's he's he did the last three Halloween films, and it's essentially those last three films were almost in, to a degree their own um, trilogy. And uh, Halloween, the the reboot that he, well, it wasn't a reboot. It actually took place after Halloween. It kind of you know it basically came out. And the way the narrative of the story was that it kind of ignored all of the other films in the franchise, and it, it was like a direct 
successor to John Carpenter's film. So it was Halloween, and then Halloween Kills, which was the second one, and then finally Halloween Ends. Halloween Ends, and that was supposed to be the, the like the conclusion to, or the final fil- film in the franchise. And I don't think that's probably going to happen, but we'll see. And I thought with some of those films, Halloween, I thought again there were certain things about it that were interesting. Um, there were some cool ideas presented on, you know, that were brought to the table. And then, but I also thought there was, you know, a lot of misfires along the way. I admired that they were trying to do something different and give give you uh, some new, fresh ideas. But I thought it was pretty mixed. And overall, I felt like it never. The thing that I love so much about the original Halloween is that it it just has this incredible amount of atmosphere to it. So you you really feel like you're you're in that that season of Halloween. And it felt like that movie was kind of void of, of that. So I, it, you know, I wasn't really uh, absorbed into that space. And then Halloween Kills, again, was the same kind of thing. I liked Halloween Kills more than the original one that he did, the first one. Uh, and, you know, one great factor of that film is the is the uh, brutal violence. It's you know it's basically Michael Myers massacring massacring people for two hours, and there's some aspects of that that are really great, and some of it's a little bit a little bit too much. But um, but there's some things about that film that are really great. It does have an how uh, a better atmosphere, uh, but again, and they do introduce some really cool and interesting ideas. But I I feel like it wasn't really followed through. There were, you know, some poor decisions along the way, I think. And there was a lot of characters on the screen and I didn't really have any empathy towards them. They were all like, I don't know. I felt like they were kind of all annoying to me and I didn't have any empathy to them for, for them as characters. And I didn't really care about what was going to happen to them. That being said, I thought it was an improvement and there were certain things about that film I really liked. But but overall, I thought, okay, David Allen Green was trying to, you know, uh, introduce some new ideas. And I thought that was pretty commendable, you know, even though it fell short for me. So I didn't cover those films in the franchise. And then I did see the, the last one, Halloween Ends. And that was, that, was a, that was a real interesting experience. I was really surprised by that film. I actually liked it um most people have spent the last month or two uh taking a big dump on that film but i thought that film was interesting in a lot of ways because with david allen green creating these movies and directing these films he was obviously trying to do something different and 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 presenting a lot of new and fresh ideas but it kind of always fell short and i felt like he wasn't maybe going all the way and and uh, taking that that leap you know creatively um but i the thing that i liked about halloween ends was that i felt like he he actually took that leap and took some chances and kind of took to a degree took the franchise and and the michael myers michael myers uh fra- uh mythology and kind of turned it upside on its head and kind of messed up messed with it a little bit and i thought that was pretty cool and i felt like he he followed through with a lot of those things i was very surprised by that film so i did a review on that film that was the only one i covered on that film so um and you know with the holiday season there's always movies that are for me uh you know that that are synonymous with the holiday season or that are uh, you know, movies that I, you know, certain movies uh, around Christmas time, especially there's, you know, a, a bazillion Christmas films out there. And there are films I feel that are, uh, that have a nostalgic purpose or a nostalgic, uh, that I have a nostalgic connection to around, say, Thanksgiving. One in particular is The Godfather. Um, that movie, that was, that's my favorite film of all time. And to me, every time I watch that, it makes me think of, obviously, the family dynamic. Uh, but it also, you know, um, I remember always watching that 
on cable um, as a kid growing up around Thanksgiving time. It was always on rotation or in rotation on cable. And we and with my family, we would always watch it together. So I always equate that to like Thanksgiving time. It's always it's always a funny thing, and and it's essentially you know it's it's a very dark film, but it it, it has a lot. It's all about uh, a family. So I just and and the, this gathering of of people, uh, and I also have uh, come from like an Italian heritage. So there's like you know growing up, there are s lots of similar traits. That I've always seen in that film, as far as how a family works, particularly an Italian American family. So, I've always kind of felt that connection. And with Christmas time, there's there's even more I feel of a nostalgic thing around that. And last year I did *To Wonderful Life*. I did a I did a special specialty Christmas show on I think it was on Christmas Day, and I did a show on. Um, it's a Wonderful Life, and that was through Facebook Live. So I'll probably do some, maybe some Christmas movies uh, when we get closer. Uh, so we'll see. And I'll, you know, I'll definitely do a show on The Godfather at some point because that's, you know, the, you know, for me, the, you know, the greatest movie ever made. So stay tuned for that. And, and yeah, again, I want to thank everybody for checking out this channel. Um, it's been really great. Uh, it's been growing more and more. It was cool because the last um, four or five days, four to five days, I have had about fourteen or fifteen thousand uh, new hits on onto the page, and the likes have been growing up, and, or people subscribing. So it's it's very cool, and I really appreciate that there are people out there actually kind of interested in in the, my weird little videos. And I really appreciate it because it's it's a fun thing. I'm it's something I'm you know really passionate about, and it's you know it's an endless source of inspiration for me, uh, particularly uh, you know musically. You know, I, like I've talked about that before, where I've had I have a background. Uh, well, I would say it's a background might be a strong word, but I have experience in in. Uh, uh, filmmaking to a degree or music video uh, working on projects that were considered to be music videos and so I've I've threw my hat in the ring to a degree as far as actually becoming trying to be a filmmaker or see what that process is like and I've talked about that in the show and whereas you know the first time I did it was many years ago and I had collaborated with a friend over where we essentially shot these these videos, um, basically more, it was more centered on these kind of black and white images that I was, uh, that had, I had created and more or less storyboarded. And we worked with these various models and we were kind of going for a slightly kind of gothic feel. They were black and white. And that was a really great experience. And I felt like those actually came out pretty good. And we did about maybe, uh, a series of, of videos but they were all it was probably about 10 to 10 about 10 videos working with a couple different models and we and my friend at the time who I was working with after we shot all the the footage we were pretty happy with it and and then we worked on editing all of the stuff together and then a, a band that I was in with the time at the time full contact kitty we eventually uh the idea behind it was to have it as part of the show. So we used to, after we had finished, after we put together the videos and kind of edited them together and, and trimmed them, we started, uh, we would project them on the band while we were playing live. And there was a, a bunch of gigs for a while. And this was quite a few years ago, but back in the day, there was a bunch of uh, gigs that we had where we would uh, bring this like big projector and basically project the the images on the band and it was cool it was uh you know very i was really into uh and i still love them they're one of my all-time favorite bands uh velvet underground um you know i think one of the most influential bands uh of all time and i was listening to them a lot at the time and i was really 
into uh, reading a lot about Andy Warhol and during that time in New York when he had this venue and art space called the, the Factory and Velvet Underground was the band Andy Warhol basically helped put them kind of on the map and they used to Velvet Underground kind of came out of the art rock scene and they basically were a, a band that would play at this this place called the Factory in New York in like the 60s and one of the things that they would do is they would always have these different visual artists uh, involved with their performances and they would project these images on you know, various movies or things, footage that they had shot on the side. And they would have this thing where they would be, these images and, and, and essentially music videos would be projected on the band. So that's kind of what I got, that's where I got the inspiration to do that project. It wasn't an, an original idea, but that's kind of what we were doing. And then, uh, you know, years later I directed, uh, I wanted to actually try being a director. And I shot a film that was about 20 minutes and it's essentially like this short little uh, 20 minute vampire movie and it, it was all improvised there was no dialogue I had this it was totally seat by the seat of my pants I had no real plan per se I did have lots of uh, I had it storyboarded I had the images and the way the setting uh, worked out how I wanted the thing to be kind of presented I had those kinds of worked out kind of worked out and I had storyboards and I ended up working with a bunch of different actors and we shot it um I don't know over a period of about two or three weekends like on Saturdays and Sundays and we would go to uh most of the stuff was shot here at my house and we also shot um some of the scenes in Belfast um, on Main Street. And then we actually used uh, one of the scenes in the film. It's funny because I was a fan, and I still am. I'm, I'm always drawn to films um, or scenes in certain films of where the character is sitting around and eating a meal. I always think there's something about that kind of aesthetic of where like the character's eating food and like, breaking bread with each other and then having this discussion and, and talking about, you know, things that are going on. So I, I always had this image of like, if for this, for when I had done this movie, Rapture, it was called Rapture, that I would have those kinds of images in it where there would be scenes of where the characters would be around a table, essentially breaking bread or eating a meal and talking uh, where the, you know, and where the, while the dialogue was happening. So we had done a scene, one of the, the bigger scenes for that film, we we actually uh, used Darby's in Belfast, which is an awesome restaurant in town. And I remember going in there and trying to you know talk to them before you know try to see if we can get permission to work to work there. And uh, they were really cool. They were like, "Yeah, sure, you can come in." And we ended up shooting there uh, like on a Saturday afternoon, uh, you know, right during their their main rush. And they were totally cool. And we set up had a couple of cameras brought in. We took out, uh, we rented out, not rented out, but we occupied this one table area, tried not to take up too much room or get into, you know, in, into anybody's way. And we basically shot one of the main opening sequences there with the two characters and we shot in Darby's and that was cool. And then the rest of it was shot here. And then also I have a little music space that I built. Uh, I, I had built this like other uh, additional building on my property maybe a couple of years before we actually did this movie. And so we shot the other kind of exterior scenes in there. And it was funny because I was really into, um, at that point I really had been, I, I'd become a real serious collector of films. I started buying, I wasn't into the whole Blu-ray craze. I got into the Blu-ray craze pretty late. Uh, pretty pretty much after the whole kind of thing uh, subsided because it was a, a massive thing. Um, and I got into it after after the fact. I had this real, real reluctance to get into Blu-rays because I felt like, well, I already have, you know, <coughs> lots of movies on DVD. Does this mean I have to, like, upgrade and get 
all these additional copies now on Blu-ray. It's going to be too much money and blah, blah, blah. And I was, I was happy with the quality that I had for, uh, for what I had for, with DVDs. So I was, okay, you know, that's, that's enough. And, and so, uh, but at that time I was collecting massive amounts of movies and I was really watching a lot of, uh, the movies that really inspired that project. I was really into, and I still am, and I'll eventually do a show on all of the uh, the Hammer films from like the 60s, well, late 50s, 60s, and 70s, and even 80s to a degree, but mostly from the 60s and 70s. And the Hammer films are the, you know, the great classic British horror films, the gothic horror films starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and there was a whole series of all of these amazing vampire movies that came out with the iconic Christopher Lee. And those films were... Uh, you know, an obsession of mine, and I loved those as a kid, and I was watching all of those films, uh, and they're real cheeky and cheesy uh, and over the top and in a, in a very theatrical way, but I just love those films, and Christopher Lee is just so iconic. I was really watching tons of those films. I was really into directors like Jim Jarmusch. Um, Jim Jarmusch is an, an amazing director. He... Uh, you know, the, one of my favorite films of all time, Dead Man, was one that he directed. And Jim Jarmusch, Jim Jarmusch was in, a real is a real interesting director because he was a guy that really um, used a lot of like uh, improv. There there wasn't necessarily dialogue written per se in some of his films, so a lot of the things were centered on these kind of improvised um, exchanges. So I was really into that idea. And then there was another director. Who I also got into called uh, Paul Cassavetes, who was an amazing actor, but then was also a director. And I started watching quite a few of his films. He was mostly well known for, I mean, as he was a, a very well known and very well respected director, but he was also one of the lead roles in Rosemary's Baby. He played uh, the husband in that movie. Uh, but he became a director and he became a really well-respected and well-regarded director and his whole thing and he he directed a lot of melodramas um and so his whole thing was his films like all of the dialogue was improvised there was no real script um and he was able to assemble these great casts of actors and have this magic happen and so i was really into those that space it was kind of a weird combination of of interest uh but i so i was I had set out with my project because I was in this kind of world of uh, of watching these certain kinds of films. I had set out to like make a movie that was, you know, uh, a vampire movie essentially because of the Hammer influence. I wanted to try to make a, a a modern day kind of vampire movie. Oh, and also the other director I was really into and I still love is Abel Ferrara, who's an amazing director from New York, and. Uh, he he's made so many amazing films, Bad Lieutenant with, with Harvey Keitel, and he he had also directed a movie called The Addiction with Christopher Walken, which is one of the greatest uh, and and one of the most underrated vampire movies of all time. And his whole thing is there his 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 whole approach, like all of this stuff, is really gritty and has a certain realism to 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 uh, his films. So after you know immersing myself in those, you know four styles if you want to call it that four different schools of filmmaking i i that's kind of what i had set out to try to do with this weird stupid little project where it was going to be you know a, a vampire movie i wanted to i wanted it to be like a modern vampire movie and i wanted it to be uh i i didn't i wanted it to be improvised i wanted it to be kind of off the cuff and real loose uh as far as where the interaction would be around, um, you know, the the whole like uh, dialogue thing. So I didn't have any dialogue written. So we shot the whole thing and put it together. And it, while I was doing it, it was, I mean, it cost a lot of money to do. It cost me uh, maybe five to six hundred bucks to do. And when we shot it, when we shot it pretty quick. Because it was about, it came to about an hour worth of footage, and then we trimmed it down to where it was just twenty minutes. And after we had shot the film, and we did it really quick, we did it with very little. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't use 
many takes. We just kind of, we just, it was pretty, pretty much, you know, just kind of going for it. And the process that took so long and, and it was, the part that was so hard was actually editing it and putting it together. That took forever. That took like five to six months. And it, it got to be a, a point where it was like kind of painful to do. It was really hard. And at that point, when I realized, wow, I'm doing all of this work and spending quite a, quite a, you know, a bit of money on just this little kind of crappy film that's 20 minutes long, I'm like, wow, I don't know how these two-hour movies get shot and how these filmmakers put together these, you know, these works of art. And it just gave me a whole new found, you know, newfound respect for filmmakers. And it, it actually, even though the process for me was so hard, it actually increased my, my love for film because, and it gave me a whole new respect for what filmmakers actually have to go through. And then the film eventually got made and I show, and I had had a showing for it. Um, I had a premiere of it at, at, at Aarhus Gallery, which was a great place here in Belfast, a really sweet art gallery. And, uh, you know, the movie was a piece of crap, but I was, I was excited about it at the time. I had a lot of friends that came to it and people who went to it. We had like a sold out show uh, for, for the premiere. And, and I, you know, look back at that whole experience as a fun time and I but I didn't think it was you know very good I thought at one point I was happy with it but it's pretty bad so I never really did anything with that after you know after I never posted it I never shared it. I never had any more showings of it I just kind of buried it and and I've you know every now and then I'll I'll show it to a friend or or something and and it's pretty bad it's pretty hilarious but it's it's kind of terrible so I don't really uh, I don't really uh, pride myself on uh, of like putting my name on it or whatnot, but it was a great experience in a lot of ways too. Uh, I learned a lot, and then after that, I decided to try to make more films, and I tried doing it, and then had all these different things kind of getting away, and what wasn't really focused on it, and nothing really came out after that. Like I never really followed through with another idea after that and you know years later and this was a long time ago when I made this movie and but I my passion for film just grew and grew and grew over that time and, and to where it's at now and and also collecting movies uh, when I tr transitioned to blu-ray it was a thing of where I had seen a blu-ray uh, movie over my girlfriend's house at the time and I wasn't really impressed with it. I thought the color the color and the transfer was like too dark. And then a couple other things happened where I had rented a Blu-ray or something a year or two later of a movie that I'd really loved. And I was like blown away by the quality of the picture and the sound. I can't remember what movie it was, but after I saw that, I was just like, wow, this is what I, I need to do. So I started after that. It's probably like six years or so ago. I started to uh, buy lots of Blu-rays. And pretty much now, that's all I buy. I don't really buy DVDs anymore. Occasionally, I will. Like, if I see them marked really, really down at, like, Goodwill, I'll buy them. But it's pretty rare. Very, very rare. I pretty much just only buy Blu-rays now. So I made that full transition, and I've never looked back. And I think it's the best, as far as being a, a film fanatic, it's the best investment that I've had. And that, and the best decision I, I've made as far as buying stuff that's, you know, of good quality. And they last a long time. Uh, so, yeah. And then, so after I never really had it, you know, after that Rapture project, uh, that film project, and I had, you know, aspirations to kind of keep making films and nothing really came out of it. I had all these starts and stops. I actually wrote a couple of scripts and did all this stuff. I collaborated with a few other artists and writers. I actually collaborated for a little while with somebody at the Main Media Workshop, which is a really amazing school here uh, in Rockport. I remember meeting somebody uh, there that was a student that, well, well, he actually was a teacher there. He actually had worked with Quentin Tarantino on uh, on um, uh, Inglorious Bastards. And I was like, wow, like it was pretty amazing. And we had actually talked about maybe trying to work together, which was crazy, but it, it didn't happen. And then, but I always had this passion and I was like, oh, I have this love. And I was like, oh, I had all these ideas in my head. And I, so I always had this, this feeling of like, 
this other kind of energy that I wanted to put out there as maybe a filmmaker, but things weren't really connecting. And, and it was, you know, it's a full commitment to be a filmmaker. I mean, you really have to commit yourself to that as, a, as like a full-time kind of thing. And I was doing other things at the time, you know, so, but when I, it was funny when I, when I started quantum over the course of a few months, I noticed some of the things I was doing felt like they had this like film influence going like that were like certain music I was writing and certain things I was kind of thinking about for the band. I was like, Oh wait, that's kind of coming from my film, my love of film. And I started hearing influences of things I was watching in the music. And also when we first started playing gigs, I was starting to work on presenting like a theatrical element to the band. And I was like, huh, this is, this is interesting. So after that point, I just, I started to pour all of those kinds of um, uh, emotional desires that I had around film and, and uh, you know, and, and all of my love of film, I started just pooling that and pouring that into the quantum project. And ever since I did that and I've made, and I kind of made that the focus to a degree, uh, the, the desire to be like, quote unquote, a filmmaker kind of went away. And, and then suddenly that part of my brain was satisfied where like, oh, okay, this is that outlet. It's a little bit of a strange combination or a little bit of a strange avenue to think about but I was like oh no it's it's totally fulfilling that need so so that's kind of how it's all connected for me uh and very much so with the band quantum so so this brings me to one of my all-time favorite movies I've talked about uh one of my all-time favorite movies called The Tourist Trap that's probably overall like my favorite you know, quote unquote, grindhouse horror film, uh, B movie that came out in the seventies. I just love, or eighties. I love that movie so much. One of my all time favorites, but you know, always, it's always a thing. If you say that you have a top 10 list, like that's one thing or top 20 list, that's another thing. But when you pick, when you're maybe thinking in terms of like picking your favorite movie of all time, or your say your favorite director or your like your favorite band, it can be a little bit dicey. It can be hard. Um, but this movie here, uh, private parts, and this is on VHS. This is, uh, I'm changing things up here a little bit on the channel. I've never had a show where I've done a VHS private parts. This movie is just, uh, I, I love this movie. It's one of the most, it's definitely one of the most bizarre movies I've ever seen. It came out in 1972 and it was directed by Paul Bartel. He's just an amazing director. And I discovered this movie from my buddy, Charlie Hendrick, from uh, quite a few years ago. I remember um, I was, and this this is going back quite a few years, but I remember going over to his house and we watched this at his at his place. Uh, actually, no, no, I, I take that back. Uh, at the time when I was friends with Charlie, and I was also playing in bands with him, he had this uh, massive VHS collection. I mean, hundreds of movies, hundreds of movies. And he had real eclectic taste. He was into all kinds of like weird exploitation movies and Roger Corman movies, but he was into all different kinds of genres. He, he particularly got into a lot of films from like the 40s and 50s. And then also he really got into like silent, silent films. He started even going to lots of silent film festivals. He had really eclectic taste or has very eclectic taste. And then he, when he moved away, he went, he moved away to New Orleans and he actually lived in Oregon for a while and he traveled, basically he traveled the entire world uh, before he settled down. And before he moved, he gave me all of his VHS tapes. And this was one of the movies he gave me that was in the collection. And he, and Charlie had, you know, he was into some real experimental uh, kinds of music, art and film. And, and he had a very open mind. And I remember him telling me that this was like one of the most bizarre movies that he's ever seen and uh but he really liked it and he, he he thought i would really like it so um and this movie uh blew blew me away it, it definitely is one of the most bizarre movies i've ever seen and it's definitely like in the totally this you know ultra sleazy uh grindhouse film exploitation film and, and, and it's 
it's like a, a combination of where it's a comedy, like a black comedy, and then it has aspects of it where it's definitely a horror movie, and then it's very surreal, uh, it has this real surrealist quality, but it's also got this very psychosexual uh, quality to it. It has like, um, kind of has a, a vibe or a framework that I feel is like taken or inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's uh, Psycho. And it was directed by Paul Bartel, who's, who was a pretty amazing director who died relatively young, unfortunately. Um, he made uh, so many great films at one point, and he, um, this was the first of his films that I had seen. And I was, uh, I was, you know, totally blown away by it. And it, it's funny because a lot of the films that I cover on this channel are, you know, these kinds of weird exploitation movies. And all of them, you know, I always talk about how we live in this crazy golden, you know, era or time of where all of these amazing reissues are, are, are coming, coming about of all of these super obscure movies. And for whatever reason, I can't find, I haven't been able to find uh, private parts on Blu-ray. It's really strange. And I've been w looking around for it for a while. And I just, um, I just haven't been able to, to find anything. So it's always surprising. Uh, the other movie he's very, very well known for is uh, Death Race uh, 2000 with David Carradine. He directed that. And then he also did a film called Eating Raul. Um, he did a film called uh, the, the, the Smuggler. Um, Paul Bartel came out of the Roger Corman world. He worked with he worked with Roger Corman on Death Race 2000, which is just an amazing movie. I think it's the first movie that Sylvester Stallone ever uh, was in. And again, that's an amazing grindhouse exploitation movie. Ultra violent and just completely insane. I love that movie to death. And uh, and he came out of Paul Bartel became came out of Roger Corman's camp. And Roger Corman was, you know, a legendary producer and also director. Where he, you know, he did so much in the whole exploitation grindhouse world. He made all of these incredibly low budget films for you know no money at all and his his uh body of work is just unbelievable like the amount of films that he's produced and then also as a director but he made all of these like incredibly low budget exploitation movies essentially and paul bartell came out of his camp uh, i i did a show way back when on film fanatic uh on, on the Facebook page live about uh, The Mask of the Red Death, which was directed by Roger Corman, which is probably my favorite Roger Corman film as far as him as a, uh, as a director. And it's probably my favorite film with Vincent Price. Just amazing, based on the Edgar Allan Poe story, classic tale. And uh, Roger Corman, uh, you know, had regarded that film as being like his, you know, his more or less like his, his, his proudest moment for, for the most part. But the thing with Roger Corman was there were so many great directors that came out of his camp, you know, whether they were working on as like some kind of assistant on one of his productions or uh, an assistant producer. They were effects designers. I mean, just so many guys came out of his camp, you know. Uh, uh, James Cameron came out of Roger Corman's, the Roger Corman school, you know, f famously known for... Uh, Terminator and now the new Avatar movies. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola came out of that school. Godfather Apocalypse Now. Uh, and also uh, Martin Scorsese came out of that school. Um, I mean, just, you know, legendary. Good, good fellas. Uh, mean Streets. Taxi Driver. I mean, the list is endless. And also... Uh, Paul Bartel came out of that school. And so there's been all of these like amazing directors that came out of Roger Corman's camp throughout the years. I kind of feel like uh, he's like equivalent to, 
as a figure in film and then comparing it to, say, music figures, I kind of feel like Roger Corman is what uh, Miles Davis was to jazz music and what Frank Zappa was to, to like, fusion music. And the, the way I make those comparisons is, like, you know, Miles Davis, the iconic jazz trumpeter who had so many different incarnations of, of his band or bands over the years. But what he established this, like, this presence of where he brought all of these amazing musicians through his camp and, and brought all these people uh, basically up through his through his school and and then they went on and eventually left the band or whatnot and became famous you know like Chick Corea for instance or Wayne Shorter Tony Williams uh, Dave Holland I mean it's an endless amount of, of famous uh, musicians that came through the through his camp. Miles Davis and that also they after they left the band or some incarnation of his band they they went on to have their own careers same thing with Frank Zappa I mean uh, Terry Bozio Steve Vai um, just an endless amount George Duke uh, same kind of thing where Frank Zappa kind of brought all of these unknown musicians at the time through his camp and performed with them and then they went on you know, over time to start their own careers and had these, you know, massive careers. And so I feel like Roger Corman was that for film and filmmakers with all, you know, all of these amazing directors that came out uh, through his camp. So there's a lot of interesting kind of parallels and, and, uh, and, and uh, similarities. And plus, you know, those guys all like Roger Corman, Frank Zappa, Miles Davis, they, they also have another similarity where, their career, their, their, the span of their careers was for, you know, an, an incredibly long time, you know, over like, like almost at a generational level because so there was all of these, you know, because of that, there was all of these, you know, people coming through uh, the ranks more or less. And so Paul, Paul Bartel, who's probably the least known director in, you know, uh, in, in that grouping, obviously, but he's actually one of my favorite directors. Uh, I love this movie to death and, and this is the only show I've done. So, well, I'll probably do more, but I, I, I only have this on VHS. So strange. I have not been able to find this movie on Blu-ray. It's a super obscure movie. Um, it might be one of the most obscure movies out there. Um, but it came out in 1972, but there's a couple of scenes in this movie that I feel are, are like, easily some of the most disturbing things I've ever seen on film. I mean, it's pure cycle sexual madness. Um, but it's amazing. It's such an amazing film. It's super creepy. It's super weird. It's super funny. Uh, it, it does play like play out like a black comedy. But I just love this freaking movie. Um, very similar in times. I don't think... I, but I, I think it, it, it goes in a very different direction. But it is similar to... Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. It definitely was, that was definitely an inspiration for this film. But just a tremendous movie. One of these days, I'll track this down on a DVD. And I've looked it up a bunch of times. And, uh, you know, it's basically pretty, it's a very obscure movie. Uh, Death Race 2000 is fairly popular. That movie is easy to find. That was a very commercial movie even though it's such a low-budget, grindhouse, kind of a sleazy movie. Uh, uh, it's, it commercially was really successful. Um, and, and yeah, it's just great. And so I, when Charlie gave me his collection, this was, this was the movie that uh, I remember watching uh, right out of the gate, because he had told me about it, and I just love this movie. And he, so I have... A huge VHS collection. I don't really watch VHS all that much. I do have a setup. I have a system set up to watch VHS. And uh, I'm going to have to watch this again. Because I've seen this movie quite a few times. But I just love it. And there's something cool that I only you know I only have it on VHS. It's it's pretty cool. So, But this is Jason Dean. So if you're in, you're, if you're in, a, if you're in the mood for something. You could probably find this online. It's a it's a hard movie to find, and I know there are Blu-ray copies of it where you can buy, but they're like 
kind of expensive. They don't have any special features. I might break down and just buy it on Blu-ray. But if you're in a mood for some really bizarro, uh, you know, a real bizarro cinematic experience, um, this movie's it. 1972. This is a close first tie, possible tie for first place or second place of one of my all-time favorite uh, kind of sleazy grindhouse films along with Taurus Trap. I just love this freaking movie. So this is Jason Dean. If you get a chance, please like and subscribe to my channel. And uh, I really appreciate uh, checking it out and keeping this thing going and keeping it alive. All right. Have a great day. Peace.